Please stand. Today we're going to read Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, and then verses 26 through 29, and then verses 35 through 41. So we're going to start off with Mark chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible reads, And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the lands. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony grounds, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no roots, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruits. And other fell on good grounds and did yield fruits that sprung up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears, let him hear. All right, now verse 26 through 29. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the grounds, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruits of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn and the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Now verses 35 through 41. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of winds, and the waves beat into the ship, so, it, it, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest not thou that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now you may be seated, and Pastor Chan will come and preach. I spoke about the role of rest in the life of a true Christian a few weeks ago. And this morning I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a review of what I said, brief review, but also add another layer of nuance. Because the subject of the rest for a Christian is very deep and there's much to say about it. So let me, review for you what I said. I said the Bible speaks of rest for the true Christian as a Sabbath rest. And it's the rest that God gives the true Christian through the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are two parts of this rest, both spiritual. The Sabbath rest, the spiritual rest for a Christian is of two types. One is the salvation rest that we have that was accomplished by Jesus when he died on the cross. And it was specifically accomplished when he said on the cross before his death that it is finished. The atonement was done. The work of our salvation that we rest in is based upon Jesus 
accomplished work on the cross. So that's the first rest. It's a salvation rest. And then there's another rest. And this rest applies to the Christian Sabbath, which is not on Saturday, but on Sunday. And it refers to the day when the first Christians celebrated the first day of the week, they came together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So those are the two spiritual rests, salvation rest, and the day set aside, the first day of the week, where we rest in God and restore ourselves, rejuvenate ourselves, commune with God in a special way, the first day of the week. But we can add a third kind of rest, and that is a physical rest. Because sometimes the work of a Christian, a true disciple of Christ, sometimes it's hard, laborious, arduous, and we need to rest from our labors. And all of these rests, the two spiritual and the physical, are all made possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is referred to, all three, when Jesus tells us in that very familiar passage where he invites all of us, both the saved as well as the lost, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says to mankind, come unto me, Jesus said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. This third kind of rest, this physical rest, is illustrated by Jesus himself in our text this afternoon. But let me begin with the beginning of chapter 4, so we can put this in context. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, And Jesus began to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. He was on the, in the sea looking at the people on the shore. And the whole multitude, many people, was by, by the sea, alongside the sea, on the land. And he taught them many things by parables. Teaching by use of a parable is the very common Hebraic method that's all through the Old Testament. And Jesus used the same method to his disciples in the new. And most of Jesus, most of Jesus' parable, nearly all of them, relate to the spiritual kingdom of God. And Jesus defined what that spiritual kingdom is. That spiritual kingdom is within mankind, within a man, within a woman. It's in the heart, and it's the heart where that battlefront of the spiritual battle, whether a soul is won to Christ or lost, that's the battlefront within the heart of every individual, because the spiritual kingdom of God is within the heart. And the most important parable that Jesus gave is found in this chapter, and it's called the parable of the sore. Now I'm just going to summarize it for you. You've heard it, Jesus, you've heard Jesse read it, and now I'm going to explain a little bit more about it more simply. So the parable of the sower speaks about a sower or somebody who spreads seed. You have to remember that the context of the New Testament was a farming or agrarian society. And so this parable or this teaching of what everybody knew about in their everyday had a deeper spiritual meaning, the parable of the sower. So who is the sower? The sower is anyone who spreads the gospel of Christ to the world. The parable of the sower. The sower spreads seed, the seed is the gospel, as I've said. And then he spreads the seed, hopefully to land upon good soil. 
But the parable talks about four different areas and different hearts that the seed, the gospel seed, may land on. The first place it may land on is what's called on the wayside. In other words, it never enters the heart. Remember, this talks about a Christian who spreads the gospel seed to a lost world. And to some, it never enters their heart. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. Because they do not allow it to enter their heart. I told you that this speaks of the spiritual kingdom of God and the battlefront for this kingdom. Whether you're one to Christ and on God's side or you are against God and haven't trusted Christ, it depends upon your heart. That's where the battleground is. And so when Jesus gave this parable of the sower and the first kind of area or ground that it lies doesn't reach the heart because the heart, the person, doesn't want to receive the gospel. They're not interested in the gospel. Now, as I talk about the four different grounds and areas, this is not just academic. This is very personal. Because Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. The question is, do you want God and his kingdom to be with you? And so this is very personal. And so if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're not saved, you must ask yourself, why am I not saved? Perhaps it's because I do not want Jesus and the gospel to be received into my life, and so I don't pay attention. Ask yourself an honest question. Perhaps you're sleeping. Perhaps you're daydreaming. Perhaps you're just waiting till the time that you can go and eat and to talk to others. So this is a very important time. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, we don't just live by what we eat, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. In other words, every word of the Bible, that's how we spiritually live. And so this morning, I am giving you spiritual food. And so the question again is, are you hungry for the word of God, the gospel? And if you are, you will pay attention. And your problem will not be that the seed of the gospel did not land on your heart. The second group is those whose heart is, are, is hard. And so what happens is this. A person hears the gospel and they seem to receive Jesus very quickly and they come to all the church services and by all intents and purposes, they seem to be a Christian, a true disciple. But you see, the ground that's hard is hard because there is no soil on top of it. And that soil just covers the surface, but it has no depth, as the Bible says. And so when the roots try to go in the soil, they can't and pushes up really quick. And they seem to be a Christian. So when we have somebody, when the social pastor Mr. Mello and myself, when we counsel people and we see people's lives, sometimes we see people that seem to really receive Christ very quickly and their life is in the church and they're all excited, they come to everything and they shoot up very quickly, but then they fizzle out and then we don't see them anymore. Ask yourself, you might not know that, that's future. But ask yourself, be concerned. I hope I don't have that kind of heart. I do need to receive Christ. I do need to come to church to be a disciple, to learn to be a disciple. But I don't want to be the kind of person who is shallow and has a heart of rock. That's the second category or group. 
And then there's a third group where the gospel seed goes to the heart. And that person also seems to receive Christ, come into the church, not quite as quickly as the stony heart, but they grow up and they seem to be doing fine. But then there is a change that comes upon them and they are become less interested in the things of God, of Christ, the gospel, of being in church. And they start being more fascinated and allured by the things of the world. Maybe their career, maybe making money, maybe solely looking for a girlfriend or boyfriend. I'm not saying that's wrong, that's good. We should not be alone and we should look for a boyfriend or girlfriend. But if that's solely the reason, then that is a problem. And these are people that Jesus describes as being choked by the cares of the world. We all have cares of the world, but we must not let them choke us. We are very concerned about our future. We should be. We shouldn't let it take over our lives. That would be to have it to be choked. So we should get a good job. We should try to earn as much as we can. We should look for a future husband or wife. We should be concerned about our future, perhaps having children if you're married, that sort of a thing. But to be choked means that that becomes the preoccupation, not the Christian life, not being a disciple, and not spreading the gospel, sowing the seed. And then there is a fourth and final category. And that is where the seed of the gospel not only lands in the heart, but the heart is a fertile heart, as it were, with good, rich soil that God has prepared because they willingly let God prepare them. They hear the gospel preach. They want it in their heart. They see their sin. They see their need for Christ. They truly receive Christ. They become a disciple. They're not choked by the cares of the world. And they grow slowly but steadily, without regression, without turning back. They put their hand on the plow, as Jesus said, and they never turn back. They are fit for the kingdom of God, and the battle is won in their heart. Christ has triumphed over their soul and their heart, and those are called the good ground. So I want you to ask yourself, all of us, because the, even within the good ground, there is a spectrum, a gamut, if you were, of fruitfulness of 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. So this message of the parable of the sower applies to everyone. It's relevant for everyone. So please ask yourself, what kind of ground, what kind of heart do I have? Do I even pay attention in the sermon? Because if you haven't been, then you are like the gospel seed that was on the wayside, never even entered your heart. So that's what the background of what we're talking about. Now, this whole thing of sowing, spreading the seed speaks about work. I've spoken about rest. Now I'm going to speak about work a little bit because there's a cycle, you see. We cannot just talk about rest without talking about work. And we can't talk about work without talking about rest. That's a natural cycle. And that's what Jesus said. Now my text this morning, Mark 4, 35, 37 to 38, talks about this cycle of rest and work, work and rest. When the evening, when the even or evening was come, he saith unto them, his disciples, let us pass over unto the other side, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full, full of water. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part, that's the stern, the back part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? It was a great storm. The boat, boat was filling with water. Jesus was sound asleep. 
But his disciples were afraid. They were afraid of the great storm. But they didn't think about Jesus and his power to save them. That was very telling. So first, Jesus is our example of working in the kingdom of God. I want you to pay attention now because it's a little bit nuanced, as I've said. When the even or evening was come, I intentionally just gave you this phrase, or we can say I just gave you this dependent clause because it's not a sentence. We can't just stop there. When the evening, evening was come. Okay, Mark, what else? Well, there is more else, and I'm going to talk about that later. But it also a trans, is a transition. When the evening was come. Well, what happened before that evening? That's what I'm going to talk about. Comparing scripture to scripture. A clue to what he was referring to is that we focus on the word evening. Evening. Evening is when the daytime or the sunlight is gone. Remember, we're talking about farming community, a farming society. And when the sun goes down, you can't do much work. Or you could read a book by candlelight, but you can't do a lot of kind of work. So to think of the words now, when evening was come, the end of the day, sunlight is gone, daytime is gone. The true Christian has much work to do. And Jesus said in John 5.37, I'm talking about daytime, daytime, sunlight, and then that transition, when evening was come. And before going on that direction, I want to kind of back up a little bit. Because that word evening is like a demarcation, is like a boundary point where evening goes this way, darkness started, and where light ended. Right? And so when it's daylight, that's when we work. And so Jesus said, my father work hitherto, or until now my father works, and I work. So we have God the Father, God the Son, and of course, God the Holy Spirit works as well. And if God, the Holy Trinity works, then we should also work. They are our examples. Is, is that air conditioner on? Okay, thank you. And Jesus said, I'm doing this slow because I want you to think and digest mentally what I'm saying. Jesus said, I, must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night or the evening, the night or the evening cometh when no man can work. So that's exactly what I've been talking about. Mark says, when evening was come, Jesus said that when evening comes, no man can work. That suggests before the evening came, we are to work. We would expect him to say when evening was come, he would then talk perhaps about rest or he would talk about what he had done before the evening came. So why am I going through this? Why am I going through English grammar, so to speak? Because the overarching view of our work and rest is will be shown in our passage this morning. I told you that there is time for us to rest, but it must be taken in context of this work sleep cycle, and there's more in this passage than that. So Mark 4.26 and going, the Bible says, so is the kingdom of God, as of a man should cast seed into the ground, the sower, that's working in the kingdom of God, and should sleep and rise night and day, the cycle, night and day, night and day, work and rest, work and rest. But when the fruit is brought forth, or the harvest has come, immediately he put it in the sickle, the sharp blade, so he can reap the harvest. Christ is speaking of the spiritual kingdom of God, 
using this physical daily experience that they all know, he's relating it to a spiritual concept. So as important it is for us to work and rest, work and sleep, it's also important for us to know when we should work spiritually and when we should rest spiritually as well. We need it for our bodies as well as for our souls in the work of the ministry. But the Bible gives other terms other than sickle and sowing and spreading. It talks about plowing, right? It talks about threshing. What are all these things? You're not a farmer and I'm not one either. Plowing is when you prepare the soil. Threshing is when the wheat and the chaff is grown and you separate the wheat from the chaff during harvest. You pick the fruit as it were. Maybe if it's a bad fruit, you leave it alone. So these are all components of our spiritual work that talk about different things that we are to do in our evangelism, in our spreading of the gospel. That's all pictures of work. So I want to apply this, this concept of the spiritual cycle to you. First to the saved. I already alluded to it before, but let me say it again. We're working to advance the kingdom of Christ within the hearts of mankind. And 1 Corinthians 9, 10 says this, the true Christian that ploweth, that's the hearts of loss, who he desires to be saved, should plow in hope. And that he that thresheth, number separating the wheat from the chaff, trying to identify those who are really saved, should thresh in hope that the Christian should be partaker of Christ's hope. Now, I want you to think about this. Paul says we have to do these things, work for Christ, plowing in hope, threshing in hope. We don't know the outcome of our labor, of our work, but we're hoping that it would bring forth fruit. It would bring forth souls that are saved, that would be good ground, that would show through their lives that they have been saved. Their heart has been changed. So when we plow, what are we doing when we plow? I said it's preparing the ground. Only God can really prepare the ground to receive the preaching. Remember the, the metaphor. Right now, the gospel is going out, the seed of the gospel. But it will not do anything to you unless your heart is fertile, unless it's ready to, be prepared, to receive the seed. If you don't plow the earth, the ground, the soil, maybe there's too much rocks and weeds, it will not receive the seed that you're giving. It's going to be a waste. So in what way do we plow? Well, in all that we do. When we minister to people and, and love them through Christ, we give them our testimony, we take care of them, we help them in the difficulty of their life. The purpose is to prepare their heart, to soften their heart, to make it more likely that when the word of God is preached, that it will affect them. That's what is done when we plow. So when you do your ministry, on Central Avenue or on the college campuses, you're plowing the heart. You're not only sowing the seed. As Timothy mentioned this morning, it's not just telling people the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. No, it requires preparation, remember. And that's the plowing. We don't, we don't start scattering seed, sowing seed, until the ground is prepared. And there's an analogy that we can uh, give next week perhaps much of what we do is plowing the ground preparing the soil of and of course we're not doing that god is using us to plow the ground to make their heart more fertile softer more likely to want forgiveness of sins and the lord jesus christ much of our work in evangelism is plowing from the very beginning when you meet a person Remember, we are the reflection of Christ. We need Christ's life to, 
to live through us by dying to ourselves as Christ did, that the life of Christ also would be made manifest so people will see us as a light and will sense us as salt and their heart at the same time are being plowed or being prepared, not for this time. At a later time, you will sow the seed of the gospel. So that's the plowing. And what about the threshing? That too, when someone is at the edge of trusting Christ, it takes discernment, it takes wisdom. Especially Brother Mello and myself, as, as pastors, we need to discern the wheat from the chaff. And we need to do it in hope. We shouldn't be suspicious that, oh, this person's not going to trust Christ, that they won't turn from their sin, that they don't seem to be a true disciple. Yes, we need to have thoughts about what's going on in their life, but we do it in hope. We do it in faith. We do it in love. And so these are all different parts of Christ's ministry, from the plowing to the watering, which I haven't mentioned yet, to the watering, to the sowing, excuse me, to the sowing, to the watering, and to the threshing. And there's other parts as well. But all of this must be done in hope because we are not the ones to change the heart. We can't reach the heart. But we can hope and we can pray and we can have faith and we can desire that the labors that we do, that God would use us so that their heart would be prepared. So when the next time they hear the gospel or even the gospel that they've heard, maybe they're at home alone and they think about what they've heard. And now their heart has been plowed and the seed has been received and has been watered. And now they trust Christ. So that is sort of the spectrum of what we do. I said that this process applies to the saved, but it also applies to the lost. The prophet Hosea told his lost people, rebellious lost people, he said, break up your fallow ground. Fall, what does fallow mean? It means unprepared. The ground that's for whatever reason, part of it's hard, part of it's full of, of, of weeds, but it's not good ground. He says to break it up, break up. That's what a plow does, breaks it up and brings it up, stirs it up, softens it. So that's not one, one solid chunk. and gives space for the, the seed to put down its roots and then to grow. And so Hosea said to you that are lost, as he said to his people, break up your fallow ground, your heart, is not prepared to hear the gospel. You don't even listen to the gospel. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and reign, R-A-I-N, reign righteousness upon you. What is Hosea saying? You have a role if you're lost to deal with your unprepared heart. Break it up by thinking of your sin. Break it up by listening, hearing the sermon again, paying attention to the sermon. And think, break it up by thinking about Jesus who loves you, who hung on the cross. And by doing that, you break up, you soften, you prepare your heart to when you hear the gospel next time, that it might be good ground, that receive the word of God and you are saved. Second, First, I talked about Jesus, our example of working in the kingdom of God. But second, Jesus is our example of resting in the kingdom of God. When the evening was come, he saith unto them, his disciples, let us pass over unto the other side. And Jesus was in the hinder part, the stern, the back part of the boat, asleep on a pillow. First, we saw how Jesus was our example in working in the kingdom through sowing seed and all the other examples of plowing, of sowing seed, of watering, and of threshing. Jesus is our example. Now he's our example of resting in the kingdom. Remember Jesus said, the night cometh when no man can work. Jesus stopped working when it was night. 
That's why he's sleeping. He's illustrating for us, there's a time to work. Like the book of Ecclesiastes, there is a time to work and there's a time to rest. No man can work when the night cometh. It's a metaphor. There's a time coming that we need to rest. It's not necessarily every day, like our bodies need to rest. Our spiritual biological, our spiritual rhythm or clock doesn't necessarily have to be in sync with our bodily clock of 24 hours, but there are times when we need rest and we are going to take a rest from in our winter camp. And every day we can have a rest of sorts when we commune with God by reading his word and, and sitting at Jesus' feet and lie underneath the shadow of God's wings and rest and feel secure in him. And the night or evening did come in our passage. That was what I told you. It's a dependent clause. When evening was come, what happened? Well, I don't know. He didn't tell us. I stopped you at that point to make you think. What did Jesus do when evening came? He told them to go across the other side of Galilee. And he went to sleep. The night cometh when he stopped working. Jesus stopped working. And he told them to go to a different place on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, away from the multitude, away from ministry, to take a mini retreat, if you will. And Jesus began that retreat right away, right in the boat. And so we, like Jesus, who many times work very hard in plowing, in sowing, in watering, and even in threshing, in our evangelism and our work for Christ, When we work very hard, we too need to sense when we need to have spiritual rest. It's a cycle, work and rest, rest and work, work and rest, work and rest, work and rest. And when it's a cycle like that, there is really no direction to it. It You can go either way, and I'll talk about that again. Now, I want to bring up a point perhaps you never thought of. I told you in the initial Sabbath, God created the heavens and the earth, man and woman, and all the animals in six days. And the seventh day, he called it the Sabbath, where God ceased from his creation. He didn't need rest for himself. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. He could have gone on creating more and more. But he called it a Sabbath, and he called it a day of rest. Now think, that's the sixth day of the week. Now Jesus, the Bible says, the New Testament says, Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And I gave you three reasons why. For salvation, for Sunday, the first day of the week, where we commune with God, set aside. And I told you the physical rest, which he illustrated in the boat. I want you to think about this, perhaps a new thought. So our Sabbath rest, our Christian Sabbath rest, is on Sunday because... And I'm using that term so you can understand. But we don't have to keep the Sabbath. That's what Jesus said. Let no man, oh, Paul said, let no man judge you after any Sabbath day. So we don't need to keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath and if we, on Saturday, and if we don't, it's a sin. No, it, that doesn't apply to us. That's the only one of the Ten Commandments that doesn't apply to us. But we should meet on Sunday because in the Bible, it says in the first day of the week, they gather together, the Christians gather together and they broke bread, which means they ate, but they also occasionally did the Lord's Supper. And they prayed, and they were sent out to spread the gospel, and they had fellowship, and fellowship with God especially on Sunday, first day of the week. Now think about this. The cycle of work rest makes perfect sense if you think that the seventh day or Saturday is a day to rest after you work for six days, right? But if our Sabbath rest in Christ is on the first day of the week, then we can think in these terms, we are recharged, we are rejuvenated, we feed and strengthen our inner man on the first day when we come to church, that the rest of the week would be blessed and we are oriented and we think about God and glorify God and make Christ preeminent. The first day we start well and we will end well. So that's a way to think about it. 
as far as the Christian is concerned. So this is a very important day. Yes, we do work for Christ, but also this day, make sure you are restored, rejuvenated, excited about the things of God, of Christ, about the prospects, perhaps what you hear in the sermons, about what you talk to a brother or sister, about being with each other, and about having been stirred up, you are ready to go. That will keep you and give you endurance, patience for the rest of the week. Let's make sure on our first day of the week, Sunday, that we are recharged and energized spiritually in the things of God so that it would last us the whole day. So as we run this Christian race, we have to pace ourselves. That includes, that includes rest. Or else if we don't pace ourselves, how can we be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord? We have to pace ourselves. We have to not burn ourselves out, but look at the long view. Now, even a machine has to rest, has to be oiled, it has to be maintained. So that's true for a mechanical machine. What about us weak flesh? So we should always be concerned about our spiritual health and especially on Sunday, we need to look forward to it. Every day of the week, we should, of course, spend time with God and his word and at Jesus' feet to be restored. And that time can never be taken away from us, that Jesus said. But especially on Sunday, when we gather together as a people of God, and we're to do it to stir each other up, to provoke each other to love and to good works, and having again that recharging our batteries, our spiritual battles, batteries on Sunday lasts us like the energizer bunny spiritually throughout the whole week. All right, third and last. Third, our need to be more trusting of Jesus in the kingdom of God. When the evening was come, he saith unto his disciples, let's pass over to on the other side. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full of water. And he was in the hinder stern part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now we've seen the importance of work. I've shown you the importance of rest so that we can have this endurance, this patience until the end. And like Jesus illustrated to his disciples, we need to take a rest. And the disciples were supposed to take a, taking a rest. Yes, I know they're supposed to row, that's true. But when this great storm occurred in the Sea of Galilee, they did not rest or trust in Christ and not only that, I want you to think, not only did not, they not trust Christ, and they should have, by this time he had done many miracles. He healed, healed many lepers. He healed someone with a withered hand, that person that was paralyzed. He cast out demons, he forgave sins. In other words, he proved himself to be God. But when the storms came and their lives were threatened, you see, they acknowledge that Jesus can do for other people, heal them, forgive them, heal, heal lepers and withered hand, paralyze. But they did not personally trust him. Does that make sense? Because their lives were threatened. And that's a different story. And we know that. We can read accounts of wonderful, faithful people on the other side of the world that are threatened with life or limb. And we can be hopeful and thankful in them, but it's quite a different story when it's our turn. Many of us, including myself, really haven't been confronted with, with that sort of trial. But we should always test ourselves and ask ourselves, will I be like the faithless disciples? But you see, the worst sin of the disciples was not that they didn't trust him to control the sea. But that they said, don't you care about us? They grossly mischaracterized the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, if anything, hurt his heart, I'm sure, the most. They thought 
The disciples thought that Jesus did not care for them. But the root of the problem was they didn't trust him. Let us make sure in all of our thinking, let us ask for more faith, have more trust, but let us never question the love of God in Christ. The Bible says that he who did not withhold his son for us, but let him go to the cross, how shall he not with what Jesus did fully give us all things? That should answer all of our questions. Does Jesus love me? Absolutely, he gave us his life. He was willing to be separate from his father. Yes, he loves us. We should never doubt that. We should never think of our circumstances and make a false conclusion about Jesus Christ. Because all things work together for our good and for the glory of God. We should always think in that way. They saw many things that Jesus did for others, but they never incorporated personally to themselves. Jesus is our refuge from the storm. Think metaphorically about what's happening. But the Bible says that he is also our, excuse me, our refuge from the storm. So when we are going through trials and terror, fine experiences, whatever the storms of our lives will be. Let us cry out in faith. Remember, that wasn't wrong for them to cry out for Jesus to save them. But then what they said later, don't you care about us that we perish? Let's not do what they did by doubting Christ's love. But if we don't have enough faith when we're going through a trial, let us pray for it. The psalmist said, in Psalm 107, 28, listen how it so speaks upon the situation. Psalm 107, 28, 29. They cry unto the Lord, that's Christians, in their trouble. They cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he, Jesus, bringing them out of their distresses, he maketh the storm to calm, so that the waves thereof are still. What a commentary on what the disciples should have done. Yes, cry out to God to save them. But don't think the Lord Jesus doesn't love you. Jesus is our good shepherd. We should never forget that. He will guide us in our life. We shall never be in a state of want, of never truly not getting what we truly need, not what we want, the not, not want in, in the, the common way we use it. We will never be truly in need when Jesus guides us. He will make us to lie down in green pastures, feeding on his word when we need to, especially when we need to. He will make us to lie down beside the still waters when our storm, when our heart is raging. And even when we're going through the, shadow, the valley of the shelves death, he will be with us. We should never question Jesus' love and guidance and care. And we have the promise in God's word, the prophet Isaiah. It says, thou will keep him, who? Brother and sister, the true Christian, thou will keep him in perfect peace, as we've sung. Thou will keep the true Christian in perfect peace. When? When will that happen? All the time? No, not always. But if our mind is stayed, and I might add our heart, when our mind and heart are stayed on Jesus because we trust him. You see, when we trust Jesus and God the Father, then he gives us perfect peace. No matter what the storms of our life are happening, whatever internal strife and doubts we have, our hearts can be calm, but only if we are told, if we are attached and trusting God and the Lord Jesus Christ, because they will reassure us and they will remind us we are in his hand and no man can take us out of Jesus' hand. Now just briefly, if you're lost, if you don't know Jesus, please listen. Please don't have an unprepared heart right now. Do the best you can to focus your mind and your heart upon the gospel seed that I am casting before you, 
this, more, this afternoon. I told you there's four kinds of grounds. Have you been thinking what kind of heart, what kind of ground do you have? Ask yourself. If you're honest with yourself, ask yourself. Do you often not think of, not pay attention to the sermon, distracted, even go to sleep during the sermon? Ask yourself honestly. Can you think about what I preached or Brother Mello preached shortly afterwards or it's all a blur? Or we said something about the gospel, you see. Then that means that the gospel has never entered your heart and you must repent of that. I can't do that any longer or else I will receive the just punishment for my sins because I haven't received the gospel, the good news, the hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. If it's never entered in, then you have no hope, but only have a certain fear, a fear of, of fiery indignation, God's indignation in the future. Maybe you think that you've trusted Jesus and you're really into the church. Well, don't be so confident. Maybe you ultimately you will prove yourself to have a heart of stone. We've seen many that begin real quick, like a rocket, and fizzle out. Maybe you're coming to church and you feel like you're growing by grace, but if you admit it, you know that you love the world. That's your besetting sin. You think about the world, even when the sermon is preached, some are thinking about the world already. Think about the sins of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All those things characterize the sin of the world. So yes, you're coming to church. Yes, you think you believe in Christ. You're here, but review your life. Perhaps you're not as vibrant as you, as you used to be. Perhaps you're not coming to as many outreaches as you used to be. Perhaps you no longer get anything out of the Bible as you used to, 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 to experience or many other things. I'm not saying that we as Christians can go up and down, but if the pattern is one of decline, then perhaps you're being choked by the cares of the world, the lusts of sin and the cares of the world. Prepare your heart right now. Break up that unprepared heart. Ask God to plow your heart. Break it up. Prepare it because you need Christ. As I've talked about Christians sowing seed, sowing the seed of the gospel. You that are lost have all also been sowing seed, but of a different kind. Follow me now. And Paul said in Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived, be not deceived. God is not mocked, God is not tricked, for whatsoever a man soweth, yes, you've been sowing if you're lost. You haven't been sowing gospel seed, but you've been sowing. For whatsoever a man soweth, that's speaking of your sinful life, that shall he also reap. That speaks of your eternal judgment. You cannot mock or trick God. You will have to pay for your sins in eternal judgment in that horrid place called hell and the lake of fire. And this terrible judgment will never be reversed. You see, in God's eyes, you deserve this everlasting punishment. The Bible says in Hosea, I'm almost done. Think of these words. He speaks to those who are lost. For they who are lost have sown to the wind, have sown the wind through your sinful life, not caring that there's a God who sees you, not caring that you broke God's law, not sensing the condemnation and judgment for your sins. You thought, heck, I'm going to sin. You've sown to the wind irresponsibly, without thought of God, comparing yourselves to other people, not thinking about God. In that way, you sow to the wind your sin. And the prophet says, they shall reap the whirlwind. What does that mean, whirlwind? That's the same word that the disciples used to describe the great storm. The same word in the Greek means whirlwind. 
And so the fear that the disciples had with the whirlwind of the storm, they, were fe- they had fear that would kill them, they thought. The storm, the whirlwind would kill them. Now think, that was a temporary storm. That was a physical storm. But if you don't have your heart prepared to trust Jesus, and you walk out of this room as you always have, unprepared, then you will experience the whirlwind of God's judgment, the fear for eternity. Not that brief time when the disciples said, save us. You see, if you don't have your heart prepared by trusting Christ, then for eternity, you will cry out to God, save me. But you will not get an answer. The disciples had hope because Jesus was there. But if you don't have Jesus before you die, you experience the whirlwind, the great fear of judgment every single day for eternity. Think about it. Think about it. Instead of the awful future of the storm of God resting upon you, targeting you, Why not have the eternal rest and forgiveness that only Christ gives you? So he's speaking to you this afternoon. The words I began, I repeat to you Jesus' words. You are about to be in the tempest of God's storm, whirlwind of judgment. Jesus is calling you. Prepare your heart quickly. Send out an arrow to God. God, prepare my heart. Show me my sin. Help me to repent of my sin in the world right now because I need Jesus now. The gospel is being spread right now. I need to have my heart prepared that I would receive Christ, have my sins forgiven. So to you who have the tempest of the storm of judgment that's awaiting you, turn rather to Christ and hear his words. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Eternal rest, rest for your souls for all time and eternity. Amen. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for putting us in the ministry of reconciliation, of spreading the gospel of Christ, of advancing the kingdom of God within the hearts of men and women. Lord, help us in all of our plowing, in all of our sowing the gospel, through our preaching, through our testifying. Help us in our watering, through our loving, and help us in our threshing and our reaping as well. And God, we pray that, thou, that you would add the increase. Give us the fruit of saved souls. And we pray that thou would do it now. Lord, by preparing the heart, hear the prayers of some, or even though their prayers be faint, Lord, work in them, Lord, to do and and to work thy good pleasure by preparing their heart, softening their heart, showing they need forgiveness of sins, that they would receive the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, trust him, have all their sins forgiven, and experience eternal rest forever. Lord, bless the food they're about to receive and our fellowship. We thank thee for all these things. Lord, bless the memorial service tonight. Help Brother Mello to preach, and thou be glorified. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.